our stress response is why we survived. It's the alarm system for danger. We need it and we gotta listen to it. got a whole bunch of questions for you you know in the book you kick it off with an incredibly important insight you shared that as tough as stress can be to cope with sometimes we would be a lot worse without it or maybe not here right maybe not alive if yeah. we didn't have it guiding us toward you know s safety even social safety it's um it is a critical part of our motivational system every day. It's kind of nudging us, thinking it's helping us. Sometimes it's a little overactive. We'll talk about that. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it's it's built into the fabric of being alive. You just said it. And yeah. that's the thing. I think we have this very idealistic thing. We're going to get to this bliss point and just live there in eternal bliss. But stress is a part of life. Yeah. And it's like an ingredient, isn't it, into, into growth? Yes. And these, you know, the slings and arrows are just going to come at us, period. Mm -hmm. And so it's not about trying to control what's happening out there. It's all about like partly giving up and saying, okay, I'm not in control. I'm going to control my body and my response. That's what I got. And, um, and then, you know, finding the areas we do have control and kind of going for it, they're putting our energy there instead of, we spend so much energy trying to control the future. Mm, yeah. yeah. You know, you brought something really to the forefront of my mind, just kicking things off, that we have a stress response for a reason. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So our stress response is why we survived. It's the alarm system for danger, whether, you know, predators, natural disasters, uh, some you know, someone unsafe. We need it. And we got to listen to it. And we are so evolved that it's become a bit dominant because it's a, it's a little bit over, over triggered these days, right? With all the, the information coming in from everywhere, from media, from news, from a, just a stimulating environment. You live in the city, so you are more under stress than someone who lives in the country. And you, and you don't even know it, right? Because you're used to it. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. our, we, we, we're actually, this is the key here is also it's it's the environment itself. We adapt to it in a sense. And our adaptations might not necessarily be a healthful adaptation because you also talked about stress impacts essentially everything about us, our cardiovascular system, our digestive system, even how we store fat. Yeah, yeah, and what we eat. We'll have to talk about that. It's shaping, it's shaping everything. I think it's it's like, the house we live in it's like an umbrella that shapes all the health behaviors and our judgments and like are we are we scanning for danger or are we actually like noticing you know a beautiful new flower in bloom right stress doesn't let us see the flower <laughs> so stress again it's valuable and necessary and chronic stress however can be toxic to our bodies and i don't think there's anybody better to talk about this than you in your understanding of how it affects our telomeres, mm -hmm. for example. Let's talk about chronic stress and what that can do to our lifespan potentially. Yeah. When I started out well, almost 30 years ago, I was just fascinated with like, how does chronic stress get under the skin? It's like this mind-body mystery. And it was so interesting to find out the pathways. The field has come a long way. But then, you know, I've been under chronic stress. Most of most of us have been or are right now and the mystery just disappeared it's like oh that's what's happening like everything changes you know i wasn't having time to exercise i wasn't sleeping i wasn't cooking good meals wasn't having time to socialize so kind of social support kind of disappears and mm -hmm. all that goes down together during periods of stress but if you're under chronic stress then you're just you know really vulnerable to every everything bad right depression disease so the mystery was gone, but there's still direct biology that that chronic stress mind state creates in our body at, at the cellular level. And I feel like that mystery has still been unraveling and we have some clues there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, 
we don't really think about this because it's just what we're existing within. We're like in this kind of glorified snow globe in a sense. And if we really drill down, so this is the the meta perspective looking at what we're existing in. But if we go down all the way to our chromosome, can you talk a little bit about this? And we'll, of course, we'll put your first appearance in the show notes for everybody. Can you talk about what telomeres are? And then is there anything that we can do to potentially slow down that process? The good news is not that much has changed since we met five years ago. And Liz Blackburn and I wrote The Telomere Effect, which was the, you know, the basic science and then the behaviors that help telomeres be stable and then the mental health stress. So telomeres are these caps at the ends of chromosomes that are critically important to our longevity. And they, as we age and as cells divide, they get shorter. And in our, you know, if we're lucky in our 80s or 90s, uh, they're getting too short all the way back then or 100, maybe in our hundreds, right? We want them to last that long. But they do at some point get too short, the cell can't divide, it dies, or it turns into a pro-inflammatory little machine creating disease states. So we really want to protect them. They're sensitive to what chemicals are in our body and we can create the healthy chemicals with lifestyle and with well-being or we can create the toxic stress soup with chronic stress when we're not managing it we don't we don't um step back and like you know take breaks and take respite and really uh temper the chronic stress it can just go on and on. it could last a lifetime that we don't realize that we're spending each day in this kind of hyper aroused state and rushing and not noticing the beauty and the joy it's it's a it's a big deal we got to manage this better everyone feels too much stress most people there are some people we're going to talk about you <laughs> who are who are, who've made it their their job to build the healthy lifestyle and to keep balance and manage it um and it takes a lot of effort yeah. But, you know, as you and I have been talking about, there are, we can all do better with simple daily practices. We just got to find the right ones that we need. Yeah. You can create your yeah. own little mini snow globe inside of the larger snow globe, in a sense. And, yeah. you know, so like what that. was the discovery mm -hmm. that your co-author, Dr. Yeah. Blackburn, she won the Nobel Prize for this particular discovery yes. regarding telomeres? What yes. was that? So this cell aging system, it doesn't just shorten, it can actually lengthen too because there's a anti-aging enzyme called telomerase that she and her colleagues discovered about 30 years ago. Hmm. And this enzyme is kind of the, the thing that changes in the moment or you know, within minutes, we can actually boost our telomerase. When uh, you know, I stress people out in the lab, their telomerase goes way up Im immediately because it's protecting the cell. It's like, hey, there's, you know, it's it's calling out. There's some danger. Let's protect the genes. They are the most, you know, one some of the most important um, biological material to protect besides the brain. Like we don't want damage to our chromosomes. We don't want cancer. We don't want cell death, etc. So the telomerase protects the telomeres, rebuilds them. And we have found all sorts of lifestyle factors related to dampened telomerase, smoking, low exercise. And the good news is we and others have done mind-body interventions and have found that it can go up as well. Mm, so that's, that's what wonderful. it's looking like. Like we can build, we can increase our intracellular levels of telomerase and that is leading to sturdier telomeres in a dose response fashion. And if we keep that up, uh, we are allowing ourselves to keep replenishing into those later years and renewing tissue. That's so powerful. And this technology really is, it's ex existing within us, you know, to influence it either direction. And essentially, so what I'm hearing with this particular enzyme, we're really dramatically potentially slowing down the aging process of our cells. Yes. And, but here's again, one of those big triggers of burning away those telomeres is chronic stress. Yes. And I love this again, you unpack stress so beautifully to start the book off. And you said something I've never really thought about in this light before, but you s stated essentially that we are oftentimes stressed because of the things that we care about. 
we care about these things, yeah. whether we're being stressed about our relationships, it's because we care about our relationships. Mm -hmm. Work, same thing. Um, you know, accomplishing our goals. We're typically stressed by things we care about. Mm -hmm. It's a real flip, isn't it? So instead of, you know, kind of hating it and thinking the stress is all bad, it's like, it's this is hard. We we suffer because we love. Yeah. We love people, we love nature, we see, you know, things that we want different differently. Yeah. Now let's talk about the landscape of stress today a little bit more. You touched yeah. on it a little bit, but if you could even within that talk about our default stress baseline. Yeah. The default stress baseline is kind of big these days in the stress world. Like we're realizing it's not just when you're stressed that stress happens. It's like actually it's there when you're relaxed and that's part of the big problem because that means it's, it's sticking around and it becomes chronic. So rumination is one way we kind of keep that stress arousal in our body. So we think of red mind as like the acute stress response and that's healthy and we need that, right? And then we recover from that. But how much do we recover? So the idea of yellow mind is that we spend a lot of time in this semi, semi high stress state mm -hmm. and we think we're relaxed and we just go throughout our day with holding tension and vigilance. And that's what we want to cut down on it. Like see that, recognize it recognize it in our body, do mindful check-ins. And the good news is, while it sounds so terrible, we're talking about the toxicity of chronic stress, we can reduce stress within minutes. It's not rocket science. <laughs> we just got to care enough and take the time out and be like, this matters. A, you know, a break, a, a slow breathing break, a walk to, you know, see some urban greenery. That's like sacred. We need that. These are inputs. Our genes expect us to do these things. We were doing it forever. Yeah. And then suddenly again, the landscape is very different mm -hmm. today, you know, where we even have to quote, go to nature, where we are part of nature too, you know? And it's just this yeah. really interesting insight that I had not too long ago, because even as we're in this studio, we humans made this, you know, like if a beaver makes something, it's still a part of nature. If we build something, it's, you know, it's a building. You it know, separates it's so us abstract. from nature, yeah. It separates us. And mm. so, it's this strange dichotomy that's taking place where, yeah. you know, we, we, we look so sophisticated and there's so much innovation. And at the same time, it's pulling us away from the things that got us to the place where we can do it in the first place. You know, it's this very strange thing. Yes. And so you talked about going from red mind mm -hmm. to yellow mind. Mm -hmm. And we think when yeah. we're not participating in a stressful event at the time that we're in recovery, which that's blue mind correct but it, and we also think the recovery we can get with sleep but even stress and being in that kind of low battery mode versus the high battery mode yeah. let's talk about that yeah stress can even interrupt our recovery and sleep yes it doesn't just go away when we sleep we bring it with us we drag it with us right and so if we want to sleep well we want to be doing something in the day to bring down our baseline of stress arousal. And especially like in that, you know, maybe hour before sleep to like really ramp down. So there are ways that we can unhook from stress and clearly, you know, the media, the phone, the work, all of the kind of triggers of busy mind are part of this unconscious stress that we carry around we might not realize it but like even having a phone visible we know now changes our attention and we're kind of multitasking what's in there if i you know if i open it something's waiting for me it's just all of those subtle cues are taxing so doing things to get us to green mind relaxed and blue mind restored restoration rejuvenation uh, that takes just a little bit of planning. It's not like you have to go away on a weeks long retreat, although that's going to do a lot for yourselves. But uh, we need to unhook and we need to feel safe. And we need to do something that's going to slow our breathing, either directly or any mind body activity, yoga. I see your yoga mats out there. <laughs> At the studio, yeah. we're about that life, you know? Yeah. That's so awesome. Um, also, within that context, this, I, I love this analogy again of because it just brought it to life for me the low battery mode versus oh, high yeah, battery mode yeah. let's talk a little, a little bit about that yeah this is just a bursting area of research when i said there's all the telomere science is is pretty much hasn't changed dramatically what's changed is that 
we know about all the you know these other players in the cell that drive our aging mitochondria are a big one epigenetic clocks inflammation all of these ways that our cells age are one system and so they're moving together and they all tell the same story which is that chronic stress wears them out and so with my colleague uh mitochondrial expert Martin Picard, we wanted to see if chronic stress was wearing out the mitochondria. And no one has ever asked that. And it was pretty dramatic. We saw that the caregivers had lower mitochondrial enzymes. So that was the bad news about chronic stress. Not surprising, but it's a big deal. That means less energy, less vigor, less vitality. And so no wonder we're exhausted, right? When we're, we're dealing with pandemic fatigue. It's like, yeah, this is an energetic demand. But the good news is that those with more daily positive emotions, particularly at the end of the day, had mitochondria that looked as good and powerful as the low, lower stress people. So mood, positive, positive emotions, joy, we know how to boost those. So this is good news. Like we can, we can boost those pretty quickly. Yeah. Gratitude query, um, turning, you know, turning to nature. I mean, it's different for everyone, but it's like, okay, we have at least probably 10 different established ways that we can boost positive affect within minutes. Kind acts to strangers, awe in nature. We have a digital platform called the Big Joy Project. Um, we can link, link people to that. And so we give them seven different ways. One each day takes five minutes to boost your positive affect. I love it, I love it. So we don't realize for the majority of us, again, just kind of living this sophisticated, you know, modern life that we're operating on high battery mode all yeah. day yeah. and just burning through our resources because something I experienced a little while ago was that decision fatigue, you know, just like mm -hmm. I was working on this project, all this stuff is going on and just, and I could just see it happening that I'm just burning through this reserve that I have. Mm -hmm. And so, but then that can carry over, again, we think that we're going to sleep mode, but that high battery, we're just burning through our potential. Whereas we could, with a couple of things, again, you highlight several of these in the book, but employing some things so we can shift over to low battery mode, you know, so we're not burning through those resources as easily. Mm -hmm. And also we're going to be able to adapt to stress a little bit better. Now, here's the thing, because unfortunately, and this is important, obviously, and you, you give credit to this. Relaxation techniques matter, of course. But you talk about the fact that de-stressing using some of these kind of conventional methods are quick fixes and often band-aids and don't really help you in the long term. And so now let's talk about building stress resilience and actually healthfully managing our stress exposures. Let's start with developing the skill of uncertainty okay. tolerance. Yeah, yeah. I like to... Think of three buckets. I know we, you know, we chop it into seven categories, but it's really about like top down. How are we viewing? How are we viewing the world? How are we viewing a situation? And we can do a lot by little shifts in our mindset. Then body up. Like we have this whole nervous system we don't use. We think we have to do all the mental work, right? And control effortfully, con effortfully control our stress. What about what about high intensity interval training? What about you know, intense yoga, intense breathing, things that bring our stress up and then down, those are a way that we de-stress. And they're also good for aging. We think this slows biological aging. And you know, I can I can talk about some of the evidence for that. But the bottom line is that we want to use and can use the body more. So of course, relaxation is one way to relax the body, but also these kind of short-term stressors. So there's top down, body up, and then there's change the scene. And that's what you were talking about. Getting into, you know, getting into nature, taking a break from work, change the physical environment to one that is not full of stress triggers. Don't go walk in New York City down a busy street. I mean, it's going to help. You're walking, but it's not the it's full of potential stress triggers and you can't really feel ease. I mean, you got to hold your pocketbook. <laughs> so you want to have a, a corner of a room or a room or a place outside that your body's conditioned to. And, and you go there and you can do whatever it is that you've chosen, you know, breathing, uh, any of these body up things. So this is, again, an ingredient in building with several ingredients in building our stress resilience. 
But there's an overarching change in our perspective that you talk about in yeah. uncertainty tolerance. Yeah. Let's talk about uncertainty. What is uncertainty tolerance? Mm, yeah. It's so interesting because none of us talk about uncertainty tolerance, but it's really important in the mental health literature. So when we are intolerant of uncertainty, when it makes us really uncomfortable and we tighten up, we want we all want to control the future and we want to know what we're doing tomorrow. We want it to go as we planned, right? But it doesn't work that way. Like there's inherent uncertainty and some of us are really good at being super tolerant and not trying to control. And that's a shift I've tried to make. The pandemic like forced us to see we don't have much control and to write plans in pencil and go with the flow. So when we can be more tolerant and embrace uncertainty, that is like stress result. That's a big ingredient for stress resilience. And how do we do that? I mean, there's, there are different ways, but one is just asking ourselves, like checking in, like right now, what are you holding on to? What do you, what do you feel in your body? Are you tensing up and storing something that maybe is unconscious that you can name? What are you expecting to happen tomorrow or in the future? Because we're probably grasping at these things. Yeah. And if we name them and name the emotions we have around them, we are de-stressing in a way. Yeah. What, are, what are you expecting right now to happen? <laughs> and then when we kind of realize, oh, yeah, there is, uh, I'm trying to control the future, that is a way that we can then say, okay, I don't. You know, we're, there's very little that we can control. And embracing the certainty of now in this moment is actually one of the antidotes of like, this is certain. You know, we're, the, this very near future is a time when we can feel safe, focus our attention, let our body relax. Mm. That uncertainty, you know, it's one of those things where it's kind of an, it's an ingredient of life, of course, variety, yes. uncertainty, whatever you want to, even that, the way that we label it can affect us. But you talked about how we all have a certain uncertainty tolerance level. Mm -hmm. It's going to be based on our upbringing, you know, our family upbringing. Our genetics play a part. It's based on our personality traits that we've kind of picked up. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. in particular, what really jumped out is based on our experiences in life mm -hmm. can really influence our ability to tolerate uncertainty. Absolutely. So we can help each other. I mean, I'm, I'm someone who grasps onto planning and controlling and using time as a commodity. And, and that's all pretty um, type A and you know, bad for the nervous system. So I love being around people who aren't like that mm. or remind me, you know, let's, let's not look at our phones and you know, this, let's stop talking about this thing that we're not gonna, you know, control the outcome. So just those little reminders are ways that we can actually embrace uncertainty. Yeah. And you gave, I love it. You, you gave so many different great stories throughout the book to really bring to life these scenarios of somebody who has a low uncertainty tolerance based on something that might have happened to her when she was younger or that was my sister child. yeah she said i could i could name her but i called her cheryl in the, in the book her name is sharon and she's been through a lot of traumatic events and um they change you know they affected her and she has a big startle response and i i think one of my like best examples of how she is uh trying to grab control and vigilant of scanning is, you know, we all want to know when there's th things that are not safe and she's, um, she's been mugged. And so she's, you know, looking, I mean, San Francisco's like Gotham city these days. Um, she has, we're doing worse than LA, I think <laughs> in crime, but she has an app that tells her about crime and it tells her anywhere in the city where something's happening. And, you know, especially in, in close proximity, what a way to be vigilant. You know, you're trying to get knowledge so that you can have some control and it's making you anxious. And uh, we laugh about this a lot. But finally, she, she got rid of the app. <laughs> Dang. Yeah, I remember that. I was like, why do that to yourself? But I get it. 
you know, it's giving her a little sense of control, but it's something that's stressing her each time too. Yeah, cause it's like crime, crime, crime is everywhere at yeah. any given moment. And if you want to know anywhere in the city, you can see a map. That is bananas. Like, Ooh, that's, <laughs> I think you know? so too. But it's also, yeah. you, know, you just said Gotham City, you know, a lot of folks is this parody with the governor being kind of like Batman, you know, Bruce <laughs> Wayne vibes, <laughs> you know. Anyways, um, but you know, it's it's so wonderful to understand. Yes, we have this uncertainty tolerance, but we can change it. You shared this great study, and this was a study that you conducted with some colleagues on women who had never meditated before, split into two groups at a luxury resort. Can you talk about that study? Yeah, I, I love that study. And there are other retreat studies that show similar things. You asked about like, you know, how is toxic stress getting into the skin and causing disease? And I, I think inflammation is a main highway of how it does that. But we can now look at like all the different biological pathways with gene expression. And so in this study, that's what we did. We, we measured everyone on day one when they arrived and then what their cells were doing on, you know, close to day seven. And what was so amazing is that there were such dramatic changes in what our cells were producing. The DNA readout was different. Different genes were producing different proteins because the stress response and the immune response, thinking that it has to fight things, were, were turned on very, very low volume. So like very low activity there in all of those, you know, vigilant fighting modes that our body um, things have to be on, you know, in urban living, they're probably on pretty high. So at the end of the week, those were really low. And then we had more of these kind of restorative genes, telomerase, mitochondria, growth factors. Now you would think, again, this these outcomes might be obvious, but what was really jumped out, you know, as far as the outcomes, number one, so you've got obviously going to a luxury resort for a week is going to feel good, right? And you're, you're, you're articulating. <laughs> Everyone felt great, whether they meditated or not. <laughs> right. So we, we got to win here. But long term, though. Yes, exactly. That was the point, Sean. So short term, both groups showed like 60% reduction in stress, depression, increases in vitality and mindfulness. I mean, I was like, I never see this much change. You know, this is like a real privilege and treat. If people can unhook and afford a retreat for a week, that's the peeling the layers of the onion, right? But the meditation group didn't look too different in the short run. They did look different 10 months later mm. and their depression stayed low. Mm. So that was like, okay, this is a building a skill that over time is going to promote stress resilience. So powerful. So yeah. powerful. So again, we've got folks who are embarking on, again, these are people who are new to meditation, picking yes. up this skill set and having these results that are comparable to just relaxation, going to this luxury resort. And the biggest benefit was they were able to keep that skill set and basically change the way they perceive stress, essentially. I think that was it, Sean. I think it was the, ch the change in the mental filter because a small percentage of them kept up the mantra meditation. Deepak Chopra was the teacher. They loved it. Some of them kept it up, some didn't. But as a group, they still benefited. Mm. So there's these ways that you kind of um, shift mindsets of like thoughts are just thoughts. And uh, maybe, you know, this idea of not trying to control everything that goes along with Buddhist philosophy. And But even Buddhists get stressed. I mean, they have beautiful philosophy and ideology. And, and part of it is um, this idea of you know causes and conditions what we can do now in this moment is different than being attached to outcomes so they try to stay unattached to outcomes and and they still get stressed <laughs> you know it's yeah. like I'll, i guess my point is it's work we can all try to adopt that mindset but we got to remind ourselves of that and we can do that for other people too yeah and yeah. i think that's what really when we look at folks who are you know uh, buddhist monks for example what we're really seeing, we're not seeing that people that are incapable of experiencing stress, we're seeing people who maybe are better at remembering their ability to perceive stress differently and to manage stress and to mm -hmm. employ things, mm -hmm. right? And so that's the, really the the, yeah. the the gift for all of us is just working on remembering yes. because any of us can forget yeah. and just get immersed in stress. Yes. But if we can remember, oh, wait a minute, let me breathe, mm -hmm. right? And you kept, even through the book, you kept bringing me I back even you. to yep. breathe. Yes. Yeah. 
So with all of your um, phenomenal knowledge and constantly learning, what I'm just so pleased you like the book, but what, um, where is stress in your life? Like, is it, you know, is it something you're actively managing and it's down here? Or is it like, did you find a tip there that like fit into your life and you hadn't done? Yeah. <laughs> if you don't for, mind my asking. Of course, for yeah. me, you brought, you gave language to a lot of things that I experienced, you mm -hmm. know? So I love things like that. It's kind of like an internal revelation, like, oh yes, that's, that makes sense. And in particular, even just talking about that study with the women going to the luxury resort, I've done that. Yeah, that's great. It's yeah. like, again, huge privilege to be able to do that. I never met anybody in my entire life that had done anything like that. Like my grandmother, when I was a kid, I think maybe like I was 10, her and my grandfather went to Hawaii one time. And it was just like, she went off planet to me. Like <laughs> it didn't make sense, right? But other than that, I never experienced seeing anything like that to just like, Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing. But the other thing was my life changed and how I associate with stress when I learned meditation from my mother-in-law, you know, maybe 16 years ago now. And it changed everything for me. Mm. You know, I, I have this substantial space between stimulus and response yeah. now. And I live in that. So I'm very unlikely to be the person who's going to overreact. Yeah. In a, in a situation and if I do start to see the overreaction come I immediately see it like oh overreacted yeah and so for me the the big thing is you know I'm just sh I'm showing up better for the people around me and mm -hmm. so it just it, it is a more of an encouragement and catalyst and I like the way that I feel because you one of my favorite parts about the book is you articulated how the sense of control can lead to better health outcomes but too much control yeah. can lead to more dysfunction. Yeah. Right. So trying to yeah. control too much. Yes. Exactly. That's yep. often uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. So you know, having that sense of control, but it's not external mm -hmm. for me. It's it's internal. Yeah. So that's really what was um, one of the most beautiful revelations reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That I, I've kind of I've done this, yeah. even though I hadn't had the book in my hand yeah. yet, many of the pieces. But it's um, a beautiful yeah. description. And this change that you had and getting that space between what's happening out there and how you're reacting, is that something that's a habit now or do you need to kind of dive into meditation every once in a while to re, uh, you know, install the, the mindset? <laughs> oh man, this is such a good question. Like nobody ever asked me questions <laughs> like, you know, you know. So this is so interesting. Just in the last year or two and i've shared this with my team i've meditated less than i have in the last 15 16 years mm. my first year meditate i meditated every day without fail i'm talking generally 30 to 40 minutes mm -hmm. every day and i i really believe that the meditation was the thing like i that was my that was the connective tissue to me living the life that i wanted to live yeah my life had changed. I was bringing that with me into the world. You know, I didn't need to, to just shut everything down and to just go into that space. It was, it, it, I found many spots throughout the day to be mindful. Like, so that's what I've really experienced the last uh, year and a half is like these mini spots. I don't have yeah. to have this structured practice anymore, mm -hmm. which is great. And I, you know, there are times when I definitely need to, to do that and I go mm -hmm. there, but, I found more spots throughout the day in more creative ways. It just feels good to go for a walk by myself. Mm -hmm. What you described is, is really the developmental goal for all of us. We want to get to the point where we live it. We can step in and out of busyness to become mindful, to slow down, or within busyness to you know have our meta-awareness on yeah. and, and think about how we're connecting with others and maybe reacting and you know it's this observational skill yeah. that if we don't have that ability to to step back and look at our thoughts and our mind we can't really do any of that you know so there's always this moment of breathing at the end of each chapter like get grounded and now look inside and try this and so I didn't use the word mindfulness throughout but they all bring us to a start start with 
breath and checking in with our body because we can't really do anything until we do that and then we can try some of these new things so the informal mindfulness is what's the real buzz in the mindfulness literatures can we get to the point where we're living it not just having a you know a monk like meditation with a big chunk of time every day so that is what we can all try these moments of meditation that's really what's being promoted now in the meditation field but I do think that starting with the base that you had where you really trained your mind in I will call deep rest states blue mind is so helpful it's a good foundation to live from this is so cool because I, I literally what I'm about to say I've not shared with anybody but I was just thinking about I had a big workload you know working on this big project yeah. and I'm kind of you know it's I love it but it is uh, laborious process and just being able to as I'm doing it just like how is this making me feel yeah like there's this inquisitive thing and I've never vocalized the words you know it might not necessarily be words but it's a check-in like how is this making me feel what do I need to do right now it, am I over exaggerating stress yeah. you know mm -hmm. like and I, there's just this like matrix of you know data that I am mindfulness sharing right <laughs> yeah. and and accessing back mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it helps me to again stay to, to switch to that low battery mode mm -hmm. when i need to if yeah, that makes sense absolutely yeah i mean we can be burning on high battery mode and not aware of it yeah. aware of it but the metacognition that you're describing that ability to step back and look in you know, it's like going from a two-dimensional world where we're just seeing, we think everything's real and we get threatened really easily to the three-dimensional where we're above and we can look down yeah. and check in and say, you know, in this moment, how is this mind-body reacting and what does it need? And I love how it can help with creativity and, and innovation. And that threat mindset, that kind of rules out creativity, innovation, connection. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, silly us. Yeah. <laughs> so silly us, and we can't help it. It's kind of tragic, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 But we can, you know, yeah. with some, with some, um, prioritizing it, making mm -hmm. it important. It's called the stress prescription because it's as important as taking some, you know, medical drug we need. We need to manage stress, otherwise we're just flooded. Mm, yes. Another part of the stress prescription is this section is be the lion. <laughs> Why is this a part of our stress prescription? So we've been talking about the stepping back and not reacting and having those moments when we can actually really feel ease. Like, are your hands clenched? Are your brows furrowed? That kind of checking in. But we can't. We can only do that when we are not engaged in the moment in a really stressful thing. Um, it's easiest to, but when we are approaching a stressor, leading up to it or in the middle of it, that kind of mindset of like "be the lion" is the positive stress response. So rather than the, th if we're telling ourselves. I am, I feel my heart beating. This is terrible. I'm not going to cope well. I'm, you know, I'm feeling fear. Like all of that really fuels the threat response, the cortisol response. And that's, we all know what that feels like. It feels terrible. So that's going to happen. But we can also try to interrupt that process and move from that, like the frightened gazelle to the lion by, by saying different things to empower us. And they are things I, you know, I've, I've heard on your show, you've talked about mind hacks and they really are empowerment statements. I mean, if we, our body believes what we say to it. And so if you're going in and saying, I got this, I have what it takes, I've been through this before, or anything that kind of takes away the threat, like, and I can only do as well as I can. And if I do poorly, is this really going to affect my life in five years? Like anything, there's a lot of options of what we say to ourselves. So like finding what it is and using it in the moment to be the lion. Yeah. Unlike yeah. the lion and gazelle scenario where it's just like w one or the other. As a yeah. human, we get to choose how we're perceiving things and how we're reacting to things. And so with that said, if we're coming into our life conditions and we experience a victim scenario a gazelle scenario yeah. in our life we can start to have that as our baseline right 
but you shared in the book, Dr. Stephanie Mayer, and she's at USCF. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She found that people with early childhood trauma do in fact have exaggerated threat appraisals of their daily stressors, which then contributed to depression. But she did a follow-up study providing them with mindfulness exercises and found that it, that improved their stress response. They became more lion-like yeah. by exactly. having these skills. Yeah. You know, we got to have some help. She had a, you know, she, people were buzz in the day. So like in the moment, you get to have a reminder. <laughs> it's a, that remembering that's so important. Like all this knowledge doesn't help unless we're able to like experience it in the moment and try it. So that was, um, it's an exciting line of work that she and others are doing to help people with this exaggerated stress response by checking in right at the moment and using some different strategies and so some are muscling it, like reframing things in a positive way and saying things that empower you. And some of it is letting go, you know, the acceptance. And so we might, uh, we might react automatically with that threat response because we're wired that way or we had a lot of early childhood adversity. And that's the first response. But things don't have to end there. You don't have to stew in that and have slow recovery. You can actually have some um you can step in and you can have self-compassion and you can actually say something to yourself that you would say to a dearest friend a person you love in that moment and you know things like this is a universal response i'm not the only one feeling this way this is natural this is how my body responds and that kind of kindness and letting go this is how it is right now but this will pass so that kind of Lion, lion mentality is one option, but also that kind of kindness, compassion, and um, riding the wave is another way. Yeah. Oh, man. We need this right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because We're... I think, again, the one of the biggest issues with our association with stress is we don't really realize that because stress is invisible in a sense, like we don't realize the impact that it has on our on our cardiovascular system or on our metabolism, right? Stress is calorie free is something that I say, huh. but it can deeply kind of um, alter the way that your body is associating with food, mm -hmm. right? Associating with the calories that you're consuming. Yeah. And as you know from, from your research, this can put us into states or nudge us into states where we're more likely to experience disordered eating or you yes. know, experience insulin resistance or gain weight, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of folks today, you know, we're, there are tens of millions of people in America alone that are on diets right now trying to lose weight, but we discount how impactful stress is yeah. on our metabolism. Oh, Sean, I'm so happy you're saying this to your large audience because we can't remember this enough. It's so important that it shapes what we eat, how we store fat, and our risk for diseases, not just diabetes, but all diseases, because they're so related to insulin resistance and inflammation. And so I couldn't agree more. And I've been excited to tell you about a new study. <laughs> so we've been you know, working on this nexus, the emotional eating, with trying to help people with stress reduction, with using mindful check-ins and mindful eating, like really checking in and seeing how hungry we are. Because like the compulsive eating is oh, it's so hard to live with compulsive compulsive drive to eat right they're just it takes up a lot of mental space and it um leads us in the moment to impulsively overeat or make choices of you know comfort foods that we know are the wrong thing but boy do we like to overconsume them in the moment right they're calming to the brain for a very short period then they lead to the abdominal fat so in this study we we um we enrolled women who were very high stress, they tended to be low income, and they were all early in their pregnancy and overweight. And so they're at really big risk of excessive weight gain. And we know that intervening in pregnancy could be really powerful. Everyone's just trying their best. They're really motivated for their baby's health. So we taught them mindful eating and mindful stress reduction and some nutrition and I'm grateful for you for educating um, the public on nutrition because it turns out that even the fundamentals, a lot of people really don't realize. And so what we found was that, well, the big news 
was that at the end of the eight weeks, they, they were so much less depressed and stressed than the control group. That was great. Mm. The, their glucose tolerance was better. So mm. like during pregnancy, we take an oral glucose tolerance test and we see how insulin resistant we are and maybe we have impaired glucose tolerance and that means you know a real risk of diabetes. So the control group got some of that, a lot of impaired glucose tolerance and high insulin during pregnancy, but the those who were meeting in a group and learning some mindfulness had better glucose from that sugary drink that they had. They actually had better insulin sensitivity. Then here's the big news. So that's exciting because you know we think it's yeah. going to help the babies. And in fact, my colleague Nikki Bush has published many papers how the babies are more stress resilient and are going to the doctor less. So we know that this intervention during pregnancy when the baby's developing, mom's feeling less stressed, baby's coming out healthier with a less reactive nervous system. Eight years later, we just published the follow-up and found that the moms are still less depressed than the control group. Wow. And so this it's what you were talking about, like what, what, what you've done, learning meditation over a decade ago, has had, has changed your brain, has had neuroplasticity. These moms, we were quite amazed because it was only eight weeks, but they, they were left with an imprint of stress resilience. Amazing. Yeah. And we passed that down to our offspring as well. There's some really fascinating studies. We'll put one up on the screen for everybody in mouse models and seeing how traumatic experiences are carried over and the adaptations for our future generations, but also providing the baby mice, you know, the offspring within quote enriching environments, mm -hmm. help them to kind of nullify that experience of stress and that adaptation that's basically declining their health and then they're passing on healthier outcomes to their yeah, offspring. Absolutely foundational work, just mind blowing. Both about how we transmit risk, but how we can mitigate it, how we can help people live well, even though they've inherited some trauma and stress in their yeah. epigenetics or in, in other ways. Yeah, and yeah. I love this because, you know, we have these terms that are passed around, like generational trauma, for example. And it might sound like a soft, kind of a soft science or soft belief but to validate these things like we really are this kind of conglomeration of our ancestors you know it's not just these hardline you know physical characteristics there are emotional characteristics there are personality traits this information it's it's information yeah. right and again information isn't all tangible these are things that and we know this we know that our genes can affect our you know our our emotional health for example we know this but do we really get it in the fact that we can pass these things on? And and here's the good news, we can pass on higher order traits as well, mm -hmm. you know, if we become aware. And so that that study is so powerful. And so like my mind is spinning right now in mm -hmm. the implications this has for basically helping to create a healthier generation yeah. of humans. Yeah, we're excited. We're hoping that the it will be there'll be uptake, there'll be dissemination because they're, you know, all the women who are pregnant, they don't have access to groups like these group support or group mindfulness. And we think it's powerful. We think the group is part of the mm. secret sauce, you yeah. know, because that's how we are social mammals. We are so much, we get so much out of sharing with each other and seeing ourselves in other people's eyes. Yeah. Ah, so powerful. And this is going back to how we see ourselves as well. Through, through our perception, I think one of the biggest takeaways for me and I think for everybody as well is changing the way that we see stress. You know, right out of the gate, you were saying, hey, stress is normal, natural, it's even, it's even helpful. So let's not go too far down, the stress is bad, we need to get rid of all stress, that mm -hmm. kind of scenario. It's really about how we're seeing stress. Like mm -hmm. that is a top-down thing, it changes everything. And so, yes, we can build our stress resilience, and we're gonna talk about that in a moment, but one of the most important takeaways from today is changing how we associate with stress. Simple changes even in our internal language. Mm -hmm. When we're feeling stress, like, this is making me more resilient, mm -hmm. you know, um, or I'm, I'm 
I'm, I'm made for this. My body is amazing at yes. processing stress. Yes, exactly. That stress response is healthy. The acute stress response, we are evolved to like have that, optimize our performance, and then recover quickly. And if we remind ourselves of that with those statements, this is energizing, this is giving me oxygen, this is good for me, this is going to help me cope, like that, we kind of make that come true more. Yeah, because our cells are listening yeah, to us. Yeah, exactly. So now, with that being said, we can build up our baseline, mm -hmm. our baseline stress tolerance. And you talk about this in the book, Training for Resilience is a part <laughs> of the stress prescription. Let's talk about that. Well, this you must have loved this section because this is everything you do. <laughs> you know, it's both the kind of fitness plus other, um, other ways that we increase our health. So even like the, the antioxidant diet and like the, you know, the nutri the super nutrients like you talk about in your book, some of those are actually creating a hormetic stress response in the body. So they're like some of those chemicals protect plants. And so they create, they're a little bit of a toxin, right? So in our body, we have that little bit of, of that stress response by eating a lot of those rainbow um, fruits and vegetables. So we know that kind of, relaxation and restoration and deep rest like those are precious yeah. and we also know that we can handle short bouts of stress and in a way that can be really good for us mm -hmm. both in terms of our emotional growth and and coping but also for our body so exercise is pretty much the best thing we know about for for everything mind body and we typically think of endurance exercise, and you need 45 minutes, three times a week, et cetera. But it turns out that those short bursts during high intensity interval training are more closer to what we've been talking about, about the positive stress of the body. And so when we do hit, for example, we are creating this positive stress state, the spikes and the recovery, and it turns on all of this anti-aging machinery like autophagy, it's boosting mitochondria. Mm. So we, we, we knew that about exercise, but now we know that the short bursts are also as good as the endurance exercise in, in many ways that we've measured so far for metabolic health, for cell aging, and maybe even better for cell aging because they're really turning on the restorative cleanup crew in our cells. Now, there are other ways besides exercise. Some people might have disabilities. They might be in a wheelchair. There might be reasons that they can't do aerobic exercise. And there are other ways to create that short-term positive stress to the body. And I call that stress fitness. So it's not aerobic fitness, but it's ways that we're conditioning our nervous system, get used to stress and relaxing into the discomfort of stress. So what do I mean? I think the two obvious ones that are kind of picking up and some of your audience are already doing them, hot and cold, sauna, get um, really heat our core body temperature, hyperthermia, that does great things for health, but also for mental health in the brain. It can help, it's looking like it can help with depression and even resistant depression, chronic depression. So that's an active area of research. And cold, cold exposure, less studied. We know less about its effects on health, but it does look like that is also one way of creating that short-term stress to the body and then the ease and relaxation in mm -hmm. the mind. We d we've done a study on comparing this Wim Hof method, so cold exposure and extreme breathing, to the re to more relaxing conditions, and and to hit, and they all help with stress and depression equally. Mm -hmm. So it's so nice. There's all these different ways to get yeah. there, but people need to, to people should know they have choices and they should do what they're going to continue to do that they don't hate. So cold showers is something I hate. I will choose sauna when I can, <laughs> but, um, but I will do like 30 seconds of cold. And then part of the training for stress resilience is rather than tightening up even more and go, Oof, you know, cause like the immediate response is, you know, is to have a stress response, relaxing into it, relaxing into the discomfort. And that's the, the challenge where you're mismatching the mental state to the physical stress so that the physical stress is purely physical. It's not psychological. Wow, it's so good. So again, there's many paths to the goal yeah. of improving our stress resilience. You know, we can pick our own flavor, what we feel a connection to. You know, yeah. of course, challenge yourself. I, I always encourage people to experiment 
of course, you know, find out. Because how would you know about with the cold exposure? Because a lot of people who would never in a million years think that they would enjoy <laughs> that, they're the biggest fans of it, huh, you know? And yeah. being able to just, again, it's kind of like microdosing stress in yes. a sense. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, and you know, when you mentioned high intensity interval training, but again, all of these having these great health outcomes with stress resilience, when I think about the ability to push yourself, to challenge yourself, and then to recover, right? And then to challenge, you're, you're, you're proactively stressing yourself. It's a hormetic stressor, right? But you're also giving yourself the opportunity to, to relax, yes. right? And it's just, if you think, it's just a logical thing that this yeah. would build your stress resilience. Yeah. And you're in control. Yes, yeah. yes. So this would be considered like a safe stress. Yes. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> That's really important. Yeah. yeah. So cool. So cool. And there's <laughs> countless ways to embark on high intensity interval training. Um, and this is the great thing is so much of what you're sharing is free and accessible mm -hmm. if you have a body, yeah. you know. And so this could be obviously doing some kind of a sprint, some kind of a stationary bike. This could be doing burpees this could be doing any number of things that get your heart rate elevated and you know do that for a segment maybe it's 20 seconds and recover for a minute or 30 seconds recover for 90 seconds whatever there's so yeah. many ways to slice and dice yep. it but the question is are you taking advantage what would be do you think it what if we do that once a week would that be something great you know? yeah i think it's great and we don't even want to do that every day you know it's too right. too intense yeah. so you know two times a week maybe three um, for people like me, I, I'm not on the extra, I'm like on the moderate to mild end and I find it makes a big difference. I'm not going to do, um, I'm not, I'm never going to reach extreme fitness <laughs> like a lot of, um, a lot of these, your amazing audience, but I, these things have ripple effects on mood and on sleep, even if you do them, you know, once or twice a week. I love it. I love it. Well, I want to ask you about, since we're coming to the close here of this amazing conversation, the importance of starting and ending our day with joy, mm -hmm. right? So in particular, since we're getting to, you know, the, our happy ending as we sail off into the sunset. Yeah. Um, actually, hold on. Let me... <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I just I was going to go down a hole. I just what? Never mind. Never no, mind. tell us. Now we got to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very visual person, so I just watched Die Hard, which is a verified Christmas movie. Yes. And, um, you know, he talks about Roy Rogers and this, you know, kind of uh, spaghetti Western type vibes. Yeah. And I just pictured him sailing off. I, I pictured <laughs> Bruce Willis on a horse, the whole thing. Yeah, Love just it. a little visual yeah. imagery. Okay, anyways, so as we come to the close here, just like closing our days. Um, you talk about, again, book ending it with mm -hmm. joy, start yeah. and finish. Let's talk yeah. about that. Yeah, the, the emotional well-being and happiness literature are really fascinating and clear. And if we're directly seeking happiness, we probably won't find it. And th those are um, some of the people who are most unhappy. If we are waiting to be happy until something happens, we reach this goal or we get this, we achieve this, that is also not a good formula for happiness. And it turns out that when we can see things right in front of us that we're grateful for or that make us happy, when we can notice them and appreciate them and savor them, that brings daily happiness. And so we can use that. We can just, we can use that when we wake up. We can use that when we go to bed. Just asking, we can use it at the dinner table. What, is there something that happened better than you expected today? Mm. Is there something you're grateful for? Is there, um, you know, waking up and just asking, what am I looking forward to? What gives me meaning today? And it can be the small things, making someone smile, doing something kind, accomplishing something that, you know, fits into your North Star. It's, it's accessible to all of us. It's just a matter of asking ourselves and noticing. And it's those nudges, those bookends to the day that are helpful to both set us up for a positive trajectory instead of like waking. I mean, believe me, I do this waking up with a to-do list and adrenaline. It's like, just wait a minute <laughs> and let's, let's have a positive boost of emotion and energy. 
And that's like the opposite of that getting on high battery node and burning up energy and feeling exhausted because that joy is energy. Mm. It's energizing, especially when it's in dialogue with someone else. Wow. And again, we have this yeah. accessible to us at all times. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to try to proactively do that all day. But if we can just book end our day, start our day with that, mm -hmm. a dose of joy, end our day with a dose, dose of joy. Mm -hmm. It's another thing that's a part of the stress prescription for a reason. It makes us more resilient. Exactly. And if you can't think of things, just we can ask ourselves in a gentle way and brainstorm answers and ask again if we can't think of anything. But what brings you joy? What brings you joy over and over? And it's those little things that we'll think of that we maybe haven't noticed. Pets come up often, coffee, hug, you know, a hug in the morning, all these little things that really are love, really are meaningful. And same with vitality. What brings you vitality? What drains your battery? What people, what situations, and what energizes you? Mm. Those are some clues. <laughs> Follow the clues. <laughs> I love it. This is so awesome. Thank you so much for hanging out with us and sharing uh, your brilliance. It's such an honor and pleasure. Thank you so much, Sean, for your amazing work and for hosting me. And I'm I'm so pleased that you got something out of this book because you're someone who kind of knows everything. <laughs> uh, that means a lot coming from you. Thank you. Can you let everybody know where they can pick up the stress prescription and also where they can just follow you? So the book is out now. I'm so excited. It's available anywhere books are sold, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. And then I'm keeping kind of an updated resource list of the, of the apps, the meditations, the books that mean most to me. And so those resources are all on my website, as well as retreats. And that website is just simply my name.com. So it's alyssaepple.com. Wonderful. Uh, you're the best. Thank you so thank much you again so for coming much, to hang Sean. out with us. And thank you so much for truly putting your life force. I love, and I've got to ask you this as well, you creating this book right now at this time, and you, you were even sharing a study that you were conducting throughout you know, all the pandemic shutdowns and all the stressful scenarios that were coming your way. And it was kind of like an inception type thing as I'm reading the book. It's just like you're doing the things that you're talking about in the book and the timing of this book. Did you know when you wrote this book that all of this stuff was going to be happening <laughs> in the world? So the idea came before the pandemic and it felt like, ah, oh, we need a book on stress. And of course I wrote it during the pandemic and I was, I was living it all with all of us and using these techniques and needing them and then teaching them to our own frontline providers at the medical school. And so it's all been very much alive. We have a pandemic website we built that's had a million visitors of, you know, just little videos of like every problem you could have, mental health problem, child parenting problem. And it was amazing to have the world now appreciate how important mental health is. And if we can't manage stress, these unbelievable rates of depression and anxiety are just gonna get worse. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. Why do people not do what they know they should do? You know, why aren't they making progress? Why isn't common sense common practice? Well, you know, everyone knows they should eat right. Everyone knows that they should move and exercise and prioritize their sleep and read every day and they do their journaling, but why aren't they doing that consistently?